Welcome to the Regent Brands Podcast. This is a place for consumers, operators, and investors to learn about the consumer brands supporting regenerative agriculture and how they're changing the world. This is your host, Kyle, joined by my co-host, AC, who's going to take us into the episode. On this episode, we have Kyle Kohler, who is the founder and CEO at Wildway. Wildway is supporting regenerative agriculture with its commitment to transition its entire product portfolio to regenerative organic certified, beginning with a four SKU lineup of planet friendly oats and a three SKU lineup of coconut chips. In this episode, we learn about Kyle's 11 year journey bootstrapping Wildway from the farmer's market to a nationally distributed and profitable brand. Kyle shares his inspiration for taking the brand fully regenerative organic, plus the immense challenges that that has created and He shares how they're looking to fund the future of the business with redeemable equity. This was a super fun and informative conversation, y'all. We love Kyle's radical transparency and really respect the level of thought and integrity he's bringing to this work. Lots of good discussions and good learning nuggets in this one. Let's go. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Regen Brands Podcast. Very excited today to have a second Kyle joining us, our friend Kyle from Wildway. So welcome, Wild Kyle. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. <laughs> We're super stoked to have you. Um, for those who are listening in, I want to make sure that I describe your shirt right up front. Um, <laughs> there's three different lines of text. The first line is purpose over profit followed by significance over scale, followed by collaboration over competition. Um, and that just really sets the vibe, and we're excited to dig into mm. understand more about the origin story of the brand, why you're wearing that shirt, um, and kind of get into the nitty-gritty. So just, just want to share the vibe with those who can't see it. Yeah. Um, but before we get too deep, give us a quick lay of the land. Like, what sort of products does Wildway produce? Where can people find you today? What are, like, the skew flavors? Like, what's the high level for the brand? Yeah, yeah. So we are a breakfast and snack food manufacturer based out of San Antonio. Uh, We produce a regenerative organic certified oatmeal, um, a regenerative organic certified uh, coconut chip snack, and then uh, a nut seed and dried fruit based granola as well. Kind of our three product lines that we produce today. So we're heavily distributed in Texas and then uh, we focus mostly coastal. So California, New York, New England areas is where you can find uh, who can find most of our brand products. It's breakfast time right now as we're recording this podcast. Give us the flavors. I need to I need to like really feel like what are my what are my potential options if I'm gonna go wow. one way. Yeah. Yeah. On the uh, on the oatmeal side, um, probably our, our, our best seller and most my favorite flavors are maple coconut sugar. It's like our take on your classic mm. Quaker maple brown sugar, but just way better for you. Um, it's super good. You know, um, organic maple sugar, organic coconut sugar, um, super clean, super delicious. Um, we do a banana nut flavor as well, which is like super home style, like banana nut bread tasting. Um, love that one. And then some fruit forward flavors with like a raspberry chia flavor as well, um, which are which are fantastic. Uh, on the granola side, we do my personal favorite flavor on the granola side. We do a vanilla bean espresso, which uses an organic fair trade uh, coffee. So it's it's really Ooh, like a nice. love hate with a lot of people. It's because it's it's some people don't like to eat their coffee, right? But but yeah, um, I'm a little bit of a coffee addict, so it's probably my favorite flavor of what we produce. <laughs> um, but uh, but our best sellers are coconut cashew flavor, and we do a dark chocolate sea salt, which is kind of ubiquitous like flavor for for a lot of people. So yeah, nice, nice. nice. Well. So I, I referenced that we're going to refer to Kyle from Wildway as Wild Kyle because Kyle and him have obviously the first, the same first name, but also the same second initial. Um, so uh, I'm going to call Kyle Kyle, and I'm going to call Wildway Kyle Wild Kyle. So Wild Kyle, <laughs> take us back to uh, to the wild roots of of this this company, man. How did this thing yeah. all get started? Yeah. So we've uh, we've been in business 11 years. So we just celebrated our 11 year anniversary last month. So it's been, it's been, man. thanks. It's been a hot minute. Um, yeah. seen, seen a lot over the course of that time. So we mm-hmm. started, um, you know, when we started back, you know, 10, 11 years ago, um, you know, I've, I've always been an advocate of health food and health products and I've always kind of had, you know, dietary um, and health kind of issues throughout my life. And so at the time, um, I did this product. I was, I was working in accounting. That was my like past life before, before food um, in New York mm-hmm. City. Um, of all places. And uh, I did, I found this program, did this program that was called the whole nine, uh, which is now more mm. properly known as the whole 30 is kind of what it evolved into, right? Oh, At the time, okay. it was, 
at the time it was called the whole nine. It was like a, yeah. a very new and nascent thing. And just kind of, a, so I took all these things out of my diet, um, felt a lot better. and was like, wow, there's some, there's something to be had for like, you know, not including soy and dairy and sugars and all these crazy things. And, and, uh, but couldn't find a whole lot of products to eat, um, on that, you know, when I took all those things out of my diet and so created this, this product for myself, I actually tried to recreate a lar bar is really like the, the actual, like true origin mm -hmm. of, of the story, but it, uh, it wouldn't stick together. Uh, it kind of crumbled and was like, Hey, this is like, mm -hmm. it's kind of a trail mix. It kind of eats like a granola, uh, you know, yeah, well, it's, it's like, it's like a granola. Right. And so just made it for myself for a while. Um, really got tired. I was going to say, of, personally, I would have loved for there to have been a Kyle bar out there uh, <laughs> just, just for me to support. So yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm psyched wild ways here, but I would have loved Kyle bar also. Yeah. We, we, yeah, we've gotten a lot of requests to do a bar over the years, but, uh, but not as What is the TAM of Kyle's in the U S we need to figure that out. I need someone to spit out that, that stat. They actually, they actually yeah. had a convention for all the Kyle's in the country to go to somewhere in Texas, in Kyle, Texas this year. I swear to God. <laughs> That's, That's awesome. true. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so, you know, something I just made for myself for a while. Um, I tell people I got tired of working, um, all the time um, in New York and accounting. Mm -hmm. So I quit that to, do, to just work even more um, as an entrepreneur. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, I moved back to Texas where, where I had roots and family and uh, started selling at farmer's markets here in San Antonio and sold out like every single day we'd go to the market, we'd sell out of this, of this granola product that, that wow. I created. And, and, and San, I don't know if you know, guys know much about San Antonio, but it's certainly not the uh, health capital of the world yeah. um, at all. Yeah. And so I figured, hey, if, if this is something that like people like here and it will go over well we're here, then I think I've got something that can maybe grow and scale. Mm -hmm. And and so I walked into Whole Foods, just walked into Whole Foods corporate uh, one day with a little pouch of it <laughs> and just told the receptionist that like I had a product that I think would sell well in their stores and I wanted to talk to the buyer. Um, that is she awesome. Kind of yeah, politely asked if I had an appointment. And I was like, no, uh, of course not. <laughs> um, but uh, but she, she took it and got it to the right person. And like six weeks later, we were on shelves in Whole Foods. And, and then it's, we've just kind of, it just kind of wow. ran from there. Yeah, it just kind of ran what, from what there. Year, yeah. What year is that? Give us some context. That yeah. was two, probably 2000 and thir 2012 um, is, when, is when that happened. So 2013 is kind of our first like year in which we had like sales in stores. So and was that uh, yeah. one skew, three, four skews, Kyle? Like what that was of three. Foods? Yeah, that was three, ske three skews, um, three skews. It was our coconut, cashew, our banana nut and apple cinnamon were like the three skews okay. that we launched with. Um, and we weren't planning to grind into stores. So the buyer just said, hey, I'm going to turn you on as a product that the stores can buy, but it's going to be store specific. So wow. Went on a road trip around Texas uh, to every single Whole Foods, Whole Foods store with just cases of granola and asked yeah. to speak with individual store buyers and said, "Hey, this is I think you you know this is a great product. I think you guys should take it." Um, and started that. We rented kitchen space. We rented a commissary kitchen space here in San Antonio and would go from like nine ten at night to like one two in the morning making granola, Dude. Um, bagging and boxing it up, and then getting it out to stores. And that was. That was how it started for a while. Um, and, and you and were DSD or you were going through a UNFI DC? We were, we were DSD. Yeah, we were DSD. Yeah. We worked with a really small distributor after that that just was very regional. They just did Texas. Um, yeah. And then and then eventually worked with UNFI eventually. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of just really scrappy work and, mm -hmm. and, and labor to begin with. We, we've always, we, we pr still produce in house today. We have our own manufacturing facility. And so, we moved from that commissary kitchen space to like a 1000 square foot. It was basically an office. It wasn't like a food production yeah. facility. So we had to like, <laughs> you know, put a kitchen, in, you know, put a sink in and sanitation room yeah. and do all this stuff. And, and, and yeah, it just became a little labor of love, right? We had a little 30 quart mixer that we would produce in and we used that. And, you know, I think we got to a point where, you know, we were having to produce like something around 200, like to 300, like mixes in that, like mixer a day before it was finally mm -hmm. like, Hey, we need a, we need a bigger like batching system, um, for this. And so, yeah, quickly went from whole foods to, to Wegmans was actually our second retailer. Um, wow. oddly enough, um, we went to our first expo West in 2014 or 2015. Um, and it just so happened that the Wegmans buyer had taken a trip to Austin, seen our product on the shelves at whole foods and then randomly like 
walked by our booth and was like, hey, I have your product in my backpack. And I was like, mm, not a chance. And he like <laughs> opens up his backpack and like pulls out our granola and was like, That's oh, wild. dang, you really do have our product. Um, yeah. Just like a weird stroke of luck. And, and so that was the second retailer that, that we launched into. And then very quickly, HEB after that. And then once we, we launched Wegmans and HEB, we were like, we got to the point where like, we, we, we need to like some equipment and some people um, to make this because it was just, it became like a 24 seven operation. We had this little couch at our facility and I, I slept on multiple times just because we'd make granola to like two in the morning and I would go to sleep and wake up and we just start doing it again. And it was just, mm. it was just whatever took, you know, whatever we needed to do to kind of make it happen and get it into stores in like the really early days. Yeah. Yeah. That's insane. Um, I also, I just want to <laughs> yeah. shout out, you know, I, I was excited to talk to you for a couple of reasons. Number one, I knew that we had a similar timeline in the natural industry. I didn't realize it was exactly 11 years for both of us. So that's really interesting. Um, and we both had a similar arc where like, you know, for me, region wasn't a passion point 11 years ago and it has become a passion point today. And you're similar in that, yeah. uh, that area as well. Um, but as you were talking about that early days of whole foods, like super nostalgic for me, like when you could really get stuff done at like the local level of whole foods and go store mm. by store and get those store level authorizations, yeah. like the whole foods of today, like that doesn't exist anymore. So anybody who's launched yeah. a product post Amazon acquisition, like they're not going to believe that story. Um, but yeah, th those were the glory days. So just, yeah, totally. Um, mm -hmm. but on that note, want to get like a better sense of like, you know, we super appreciate the intro story, whole foods, H E B Wegmans. When did regen become something that you first heard about? How did you hear about it? And why did you decide you wanted to incorporate that and support that as part of your business? Yeah. And so, you know, on the, re so the brand for us started, my impetus for it was I just wanted to get people to eat real food, right? Real whole yeah. food, like get back to right. like where food came from, like eat food that was grown or that lived, right? Not all this processed stuff, right? And so, we mm -hmm. all, you know, something that we've always, that's always been a part of the brand is our, our, our focus on 100% real food. Um, and then we've always used this mantra of trying to get people back to the wild, right? Mm -hmm. Wild way, like that's kind of the impetus behind wild way and where that came from. Let's get people back to oh, the yeah. wild. Um, you know, and we, we always said that from a physical standpoint as well, like get outside, right? Get some sunlight, like do those things. And like, and then also eat food that's like grown or live that's all natural. And so that's always been a big part of our brand. And so I think over time, you know, as, as, as the brand shifted, you know, we started really early on, like in this, you mentioned earlier in the kind of the grain free and the paleo space. When we started like paleo was super new and nascent and grain free was really new. Mm -hmm. That's what retailers really wanted. And so we got really quickly stuck, sucked into this like paleo grain free, like space, like that kind of became our, mm -hmm. like our, our big moniker that, that we went after because retailers were asking like, Hey, we want more grain free stuff. We want more paleo stuff. Like this is exploding. Like we want these products. And so that, yeah. We right. grew really quickly, like based on this moniker of grain free. And so, um, but as that kind of evolved over time, you know, we, you know, we realized more and more that like the brand became synonymous with diet culture, right? Which is something that mm. I, I never really wanted for the brand. I never really wanted the brand to be so synonymous with, with diet mm. culture and like paleo and keto and all of these other things. And that's kind of what it started to become synonymous with. And so really kind of took a step back, uh, I would say three or four years ago and said, Hey, you know, this is not really what I want our brand to stand for. Right? Like this has been great growth and like, you know, retailers have loved it. And like the keywords convert online. It's great. Like it's fantastic. Um, but I don't want to really run a brand that's not almost a diet culture. I think diet culture, um, really, you know, brings more negative things to the food industry than positive. Right. Um, and mm -hmm. I think what, you know, it really kind of like, hit home for me the most, um, years ago when I was in, you know, I was in Costco of all places like shopping and, and was like listening to a couple super excited about like their, their, uh, keto diet that they were doing. And, and, and I looked in their cart and it was like keto cookies and like pancakes and like chocolate yeah. and like crackers and like, oh, and I was like, man, there's not a single like meat or like vegetable. And they're like, this is crazy. Um, and realized like how far we had, we had taken this whole movement as, as far as mm -hmm. like just processing it and turning it into junk. And so that was kind of like the real, like, okay, we need to do something about this and we need to move in a different direction. And so, um, you know, the more I started to think about it, the more I said, Hey, if we're going to really talk to people about getting back to the wild, then we need, need to really embrace kind of the agricultural principles that also take us there and the way these things are grown and how they're grown and, and where they're grown and really focus a lot more on our ingredients and supply chain, not just like, the ingredients being better for people, but like the ingredients being better for the planet as well. And so that kind of started my whole like 
research and kind of involvement into kind of what, where can we kind of take the brand and evolve the brand that has a lot more to do with how these things are grown and like the holistic impact that can really have on the entire system. And so started doing a lot of that work. Um, 2020 kind of derailed a lot of that for us about a little over a third yeah. of our business was in food service at the time. So oh, when 2020 wow. happened, we pretty much lost a third of our, you know, 35% yeah. of our business, like overnight, just, just like, boom. Wow, um, and so yeah, it was at that point, we're like, okay, well, let's, let's table some of the stuff that we're trying to do and just survive for, a, you know, a couple of years. And then, right. um, and then kind of do more of that work. And so um, once things kind of settled down a little bit and some of that business started coming back, we started really digging into the supply chain side and saying, okay, um, and doing a lot more research, learning a lot more about regenerative and the outcomes. Um, and that was really kind of the impetus of this, started this kind of snowball effect of like how we're gonna shift the brand from from this grain-free and diet culture, you know, that, that, that did really well for us, you know, for like a decade, but, but was, was not something that, that really excited me as an entrepreneur or something that I really wanted the brand to stand for. I really wanted to have a more holistic um, approach and holistic take on the products and what they did for the system as a whole. And so that's what really drove us to kind of do a lot more with regenerative and organic and how these things are being grown. And, and yeah, so. Had, Kyle, had the brand always been USDA organic before that, or was even organic part of like a transition journey too? No. Yeah, organic's been a transition journey too. So we're still working on transitioning um, the granola to 100% organic as well. So it's okay. it initially right out the gate. Um, initially right out the gate, it did start as organic. So that was our goal: was to source everything organic as much as possible. Um, and then we started, you know, learning a lot more about the cost of distribution and retail. Yeah. Um, and all of those things and realized like we had a product that sat at like nine ninety nine on the shelf, right? you know, and, and this has always been like a, um, something that's like kind of tugged at my heartstrings over the years is, is the fact that like, I grew up in a super like middle, lower middle income, like household, right? I grew up in a really mm -hmm. small town. My mom was a teacher. My dad worked at the power plant. Like early on in the business, I realized like, man, like my family growing up wasn't going to, couldn't even afford to like buy the own product that I'm creating mm -hmm. today. Right. Cause yeah. I'm pricing you know, my own, you know, my, my own family, like out of the market, you know, and that, that was yeah. something that really, you know, sat heavy on me. I wanted to make products that were also accessible to people that really needed them. And so, yeah. um, we scaled kind of some of that stuff back in order to make the product more accessible. Um, and now, you know, we had to do that to get to scale as well and to get to margin and to get to profitability and get to margin. Um, yeah. so we've never raised any money over time either. We've bootstrapped it. And so, you know, we had to make a, some really hard choices on the ingredient side and product side to say, hey, if we're going to bootstrap this, then we've got to have margins that are going to allow us to grow profitably. Um, and so we made some really tough changes on the ingredient side early on. And so now that we've kind of grown and have a little bit more scale um, and, and a little bit of legs underneath us, now we're kind of going back and saying, OK, let's do what we kind of initially wanted to do with all the ingredients, transition all of them organic and then kind of also take that a step further on the regenerative side. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, impressive, Super impressive to bootstrap anything for 11 years, especially in CPG. So just commend you for that. Um, yeah, I'm super curious about like, what was the team's initial reaction when you started playing around with this new vision? Specifically, I don't know if like you're handling, handling raw material purchasing or if that's someone else, like specifically from a procurement perspective where people just like, bruh, no chance we're doing this or were people like really excited about it? Like how, how was that journey like? Cause I think we've talked a lot about agronomy in a lot of the episodes, but maybe the better topic for a brand like for like y'all is like, how did you procure these items? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I've had a pretty heavy hand in a lot of the procurement and the supply chain side of it, um, especially the yeah. initial a lot of the initial sourcing a lot of it. Um, you know, I think the reaction for a lot of the team was just like, like it's always just been like all right let's do this like if you want to do this like let's it's always just been like a let's do it right <laughs> this is what we want to do Love and that. this is what we want to stand for like it's going to be difficult but like you know f it like let's go like let's just let's yeah. like let's just do it right i mean and that's kind of been our mantra yeah. over time like we've, we've always had to do, try to do a lot with a little and so you know our team's always it's been ingrained in our entire team of like hey like it's going to be hard it's going to be difficult we're going to have to work a lot harder for things um given the fact that we just don't have a lot of capital and so um, that kind of grit and determination has always been like a real big part of our culture. And so, you know, mm -hmm. when we're starting to make this transition, like, Hey, this is, we're going to have to work. We're working direct with a lot of people. Now we're going to start importing things direct. Um, the lead times are going to be a lot longer. Um, the cash flow, you know, gap is going to be a lot larger. Um, there's going to be a lot of things that we're going to have to consider. Um, and so those are just kind of team discussions that we sat everybody down and said, Hey, here's how things are 
going to be changing from a cash flow perspective and an ingredient perspective yeah. and a sourcing perspective. And, and, but if this is something that we really want to do, then, then it's worth it, right? Let's do it. Um, and, yeah. and so, yeah. Well, let, let's talk about why that's so hard from a retail execution perspective. You know, we've had a number of different brands on here and I think that not to say it's ever easy to start a regenerative brand, but when you start from zero in your supply chain and you get to start with regenerative ingredients and grow that, that's different than having an existing supply chain and having to transition yeah. and deal with certifications yeah. and new SKUs and retailer requirements. So let's let's kind of dive in a little bit there and talk about what that transition looked like from like a SKU perspective. If it's like, hey, we're going rock on everything or we had to start small with rock and what that transition plan looks like over the next, you know, one, three, five years. Yeah, yeah, it has been, um, it's been a fun transition over, over the past couple of years. Um, and so, you know, we, we've we dedicated to, to going fully rock certified on everything. And so, you know, what oh, yeah. that means for us is we've had to make some kind of hard, we've kind of had to make some really hard decisions on things. Um, mm -hmm. We had, we, we produced kind of a nut and seed based hot cereal that just did not have a path ingredient wise to go rock. And so we had, we discontinued it, right? We just made the hard choice to say mm -hmm. like, hey, like, we're going to stop producing this. Like this isn't something that's going to get us to the go next goal that we have. And so if we're wow. truly dedicated to wow. doing this, then we can't, we can't like have one foot on either side of the line. Like we neither need to go there. We need to not go there. Right. And so right. discontinue that product line. Um, the granola is going to be a lot more difficult to transition there. I still like hopeful that we'll be able to get there in the next year or two. I think there's going to have to be some ingredient formulation changes and, and to be able to get there. Um, and it's going to be a process. It's going to take time, um, especially going from that conventional supply chain to organic, to regenerative organic. It's yeah. not something that we can do overnight. Um, there's cost considerations, right? And then, you know, taking that to distribution and retail, of course, you have to get the distributor 90 days to change price. And of course, you know, because we have a year shelf life, the distributor is going to buy up a whole year of inventory during those 90 days, of course, at the lower price before we change prices. And so there's there's all of those wonderful considerations. Right. And then, you know, and then we're dealing also with want to throw out there on the distributor piece real quick. Um, in my experience, certain distributors will actually charge you a fee to go from conventional to organic because they have to change some paperwork on their end. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole nother like bottleneck, like like. The fact that you're being disincentivized to make that transition is just like an yeah. additional financial hurdle that brands trying to do the right thing have to address. And it's such yeah. a backward system. So I just want to call that out the, as well while we're talking about these challenges. Sorry to the, interrupt. The product, yeah. the product no, also has to be handled and stored differently if it's organic too. It can only be handled and stored with other yes. organic products. So there's an, there's an operational hurdle too. Yeah, yeah, and we've we've faced a lot of those operational challenges as well. So we've had to contract out third-party warehouses for storage. Mm. Um, so a lot of the ingredients that we're bringing in in order to get in order to get our pricing where we need to get sourcing them organic, right. we have to buy more of them. Mm. So now it doesn't yeah. need to create a bigger cash flow gap, but now it creates a storage problem. And those things have to be stored because they're not fumigated or there's no yeah. chemicals. They have to be stored refrigerated, right? We can't store them ambient, right? Because now we start to yeah. deal with pest issues. And so all of our storage here has always been ambient. And so, you know, now we have to go contract a third party refrigerated warehouse to store a lot of these things that are now organic, wow. um, which is just adds to the extra freight cost. So you have to freight it there, pay for storage, freight it back. And so it, it mm -hmm. logistically, it becomes a lot more complicated to make that transition because not only, you know, not only is just the raw material pricing increase, but we have to think of, okay, now we have, are we have to freight it refrigerated? Do we have to store it refrigerated? Um, you know, and all the pricing considerations from distribution into retail, um, it becomes, a, it becomes quite a large, like, you know, piece of the pie, right? It becomes a, a, a lot to chew on, right? When you start factoring in all of those things and, and trying to build all those things into your margin calculations and redoing all of those things, it, it can become a nightmare, right? It can become a big, especially with something like a granola that's got, you know, we're trying to do it with, you know, a dozen ingredients, right? Maybe. And so yeah, what, it's, it's, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. <laughs> what is the percentage threshold? Yeah. Like, let's just talk the basic simple of multi-ingredients can be harder because there's multiple ingredients to be rock certified on pack yeah. product, it has to be 85, 90, 95%. Like what is the actual threshold? 95, 95. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah, it's strong, 95. Man. So same as organic. Ah. Yeah. It's the same as organic. So yeah. So it's, it's yeah. not much can be not, it's just, you know, an organic is the same 95%. And so, um, right. In order to really achieve those outcomes, you know, you all or nothing, right. You've got to go the full, you've got to, yeah. you've got to take the full way. So, yeah. 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 Man, doing the Lord's work. It certainly doesn't sound easy. I commend you for <laughs> walking into this with both eyes open. Um, it really sounds like a, a difficult problem to try to solve for. 
Um, I do want to kind of like take us back to something you said earlier, because I think it's really important to touch on. Um, you mentioned that your original intentions in starting the brand were to get people to eat whole real food. And that sort mm. of ended up riding the coattails of this other wave of like the, the rise of paleo, CrossFit, keto, et cetera. And you kind of got jumbled yeah. in there. And as they're like that movement, though, probably well-intentioned was sort of optimizing for a single thing. And that was essentially net carbs, right? Especially on the keto yeah. front, like net carbs. Yeah. Um, and as, as you were describing that, it made me think of regular agriculture, which is optimizing for another single thing, which is yield and the, mm -hmm. the downside in doing that. So in keto, you go towards this, like not real food, system same with optimizing for yield it's like you end up just eating not real food um so i just thought that was an interesting parallel and it's sort of bringing you towards regenerative and like i guess th this is sort of an off top off the topic question that we haven't asked before but for the regenerative movement how do we ensure that that movement doesn't end up optimizing for the one single thing that could end up derailing the entire movement and putting us like mm. into this position where there's just like quote regen cookies that are made with regenerative organic Franken foods and yeah. it, it kind of like bastardized <laughs> what we're all trying to accomplish. My, yeah. before, yeah. I before mean, you answer Kyle, my friend and colleague in the space, David Lazax calls that climate smart diabetes, uh, which I think is, which I think is beautiful <laughs> and very scary. That's yeah. Yeah. That's a great, a great way to put it. Yeah. A great yeah. way to put it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I and mean, we've always been anti, we've always been anti fake food. Right. Um, but I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I think a lot, this says, says a lot of it right about what we have to prioritize as a company and what you have to prioritize as a, as a farmer and as a grower and as a producer, right? You have to prioritize purpose over simply profit, right? You have to prior, mm. prioritize significance over scale and we have to prioritize collaboration over competition, right? There's a lot of ways that we can, mm. we can get collaborative in this space, you know, from mm. the ground up, right? As a producer and as a CPG brand, um, there's a lot of ways that we can, that we can collaborate versus compete. Um, and to where we, we, we can all, where, where we can all be more successful. Right. And so I think that that's, that's a big thing that it's going to take, right. Is being a lot more collaborative and prioritizing doing something that's significant over doing something that can simply be scalable. Right. Because I think, you know, regenerative has proved this as well. Um, and maybe, I, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not a farmer, right. And I don't want to speak for them, but I, I want to say that there's enough data out there to say that regenerative has proved that that significance over scale can matter. Right. And you can be profitable working towards significance rather than simply working towards scale alone. Right. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And I want to tip my yeah. cap to ROC and Bronner's and the Rodale Institute and Bridget Gilmore and other people that are really trying to do some really cool pre pre competitive supply chain building together. I mean, Kyle and I have been in the rooms and yeah. so have you wild Kyle for a lot of those conversations now. And I think that whole group would admit to you it's nowhere near where they want it to be but they're laying the right groundwork and infrastructure to try and get those people in the room that are all sourcing the same things or from the same systems. And, you know, I had like a really yep. interesting call with um, Trotten Organics, which is a big organic supplier to the US, but they're based in the Netherlands. Yep. And they have ROC Cacao and they have a few other things that are like right on the cusp and they need an anchor customer. And so it's like all those parts of the value chain, certification bodies, the brands, the ingredient suppliers, the farmers, and the actual, the actual production systems, getting those folks continually into these same rooms, whether it's virtual or in person, and building those pre-competitive like supply chains so that hopefully it reduces a lot of that logistical friction or the cogs or all those things that you just went through that laundry list of challenges to, to make the transition. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's, you know, and I, I've never had any problem like sharing our suppliers, where we're getting stuff from, how we're getting it from. I mean, I just, mm. I've had multiple conversations with Emily, right? Over at Little Bucks and said, hey, like mm -hmm. you're using like a lot of the same ingredients that we're using and sourcing a lot of the same things that we're sourcing rock. Like, why aren't we like purchasing these right. things together and like sharing container loads to come over here? Like, why are, why have we not been doing yep. that? Like, let's start doing that, right? And if, and if mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and even if like, you know, we're shipping things separately, if like you don't, you don't have something that you need that like I have that I'm storing in my own warehouse for our stuff and I can, I have stuff that I can supply to you like absolutely all day. Like, just let me know and, and I'll ship it to you. You know, we'll, we'll get it out to you that day, right? Because it's, it's, we're all working on the same thing, right? We're all working on solving the same problem. Like, and, and, and that's one of the big, you know, issues have always had with our food system is like, we're, we're, we're all working on changing something that's broken within our food system, right? We all have the same goal, right? And so it benefits all of us to be a lot more collaborative than it is to be competitive, right? It'll benefit all of us so much more to be collaborative than it is to be competitive, right? The, the example that I've, that, that I've used in the past to people was like, so 
if if think of if Apple when Apple came out with the iPhone, if they said, hey, like we're going to internally develop apps ourselves, right, and that's it, right? Like we're going to do all the app development for just Apple, and it's going to be all Apple's people, right? Like that would have made Apple billions of more dollars, right? Um, but it wouldn't have accelerated technology yeah. nearly as fast as if they had said, hey, we're going to outsource this. Like any developer who wants to develop something, like develop it, put it on our platform, like cool, right? Like yeah. so they open sourced that and made it collaborative and like everyone has benefited, right? Including them, right? Um, it's not like, you know, it's not like iPhone is like, it's, it's like a secondary phone for people, right? It's like they've, it's just continued to benefit them. So we need to think about that kind of thing the same way in our food system, right? And what ways can we open source things and make things more collaborative? So we will all benefit and this regenerative movement that we're all trying to build will benefit as well. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, the yeah. collaboration is always music to me and AC's ears. So it's something we feel super strongly about. Um, I appreciate mm-hmm. the examples you're sharing. Um, I'm curious from your perspective, you, what you mentioned with Little Bucks specifically is like very much like supply chain logistic collaboration. What other sorts of collaboration would you like to see in the movement, whether that's mm. more back end, like, you know, back of house development mm. side or like front end brand side or retailer or, you know, whatever. I don't want to put words in your mouth. So what other yeah. sorts of collaboration do you want to see? Yeah, I think there's I think there's a lot that can be done, right? Um, I think there's a lot that can, st- that can still be done from the retail side as well. Um, and you guys are working on that with the coalition, right? But I, I know there's a lot that can be done from the retail side um, to prioritize um, this movement and give preference to people that are that are doing these things. Um, and there's because the education piece is still a huge component, right? It's still a huge component for the consumer. And so the more we can share the cost of that education piece and getting getting that education out there and helping people understand here's why this is better for you here's why this is better for the environment um you know that that that's just going to help everybody right no one brand is going to benefit from that education piece we'll all benefit from that so i think that that's um, i think that that's a big part of it um, but i think there's also a lot that can be done on the supply chain side as far as processing goes as well um and so you know and this goes back to the significance over scale right i think there's a lot of of farmers out there that have supply of regenerative stuff that don't necessarily have a market for it because either maybe it's not enough volume, not enough pounds to take to like a big aggregator. And so how do we help those farmers solve their crop rotation problem, right? How do we help them say, hey, I want you to rotate all these things and I'm going to collaborate with a bunch of different brands and a bunch of different companies to create a processing facility that will process your you know, 10,000 pounds of what you have, right? Instead of like the 100,000 pound minimum that you might need for a large processor, um, because I'm aggregating a lot of small farms and smaller producers together um, to create, uh, to then create a supply chain where then CBG brands can come in and say, hey, I don't have to do the work to like source from like 30 different small farms. You know, there's people that are helping aggregate a lot of that volume for me, you know, um, to help save on costs, logistics, everything else. So I think there's a lot that can still be done in the supply chain. Um, you know, internationally that becomes a little tough, but domestically, I think there's still, you know, an enormous amount of opportunity there to kind of help, um, to help aggregate a lot of this for people. Yeah. So true, man. And the, we had, we had like a buckwheat post on LinkedIn from the, the recent episode with Pacha and it was a bunch of really cool, different voices, whether it be brand farmers, processors chiming in on like what is holding buckwheat back. And it was processing in markets and really aggregated supply and demand. Yeah. And so I, I really am such a stand for what Mad Markets is doing and what they've built, which is no infrastructure yeah. now, but they want to get into the physical infrastructure piece. And I think that's the right path. And so we have to get to the, to the point where we have that for multiple different regenerative sourcing buckets. So they're obviously doing organic grain rotation um, and, and ROC, you know, grain. But like, how do we do that for all these other commodities as well? And I do think it's really important to bring back the whole, hey, just the transaction piece is really important because it's really hard to scale direct trade by itself. So we have to have this kind of aggregated yeah. supply, but also the hard infrastructure really matters because just the com- just the example you gave with working with Emily, you- y'all can help each other a lot, but you could help each other so much more if it was a shared like actual warehouse space and you could split right. that cost and the dollars and cents can really get split up at the end of the day operationalizing that. So that was kind of a mouthful, but I think just yeah. that work is so yeah. important. I'm so bullish on that being a huge unlock for all of it. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, and you made a good point as well as, as the far that there needs to be a market for a lot of that. Right. And so, mm-hmm. you know, I think, you know, I, I, I really want to put some of that onus on the retailers, right, as well, um, right? Because it would be nice to have a retailer not come to me and say, hey, what do you got that's keto? That's hot now. 
Um, it'd be nice to have a retailer come to me and say, mm. hey, like, we need to do more with buckwheat because that's, you know, we see that there's a lot of potential there. We need to do more with region grains because there's a lot of potential there. Can you make something for me with this, right? Instead yeah. of, hey, can you make something for me that's got one gram net carb and maybe with erythritol, right? Like, because that's what we're experiencing now, right? right? You know, we've had retailers come to us and say, hey, we want more keto stuff, right? We need like, this is great. This is huge. Like, you know, yeah. like, well, you know, that's nice. But what? What are we doing collectively if that's what we're continuing to push at the retail level, right? And these are natural retailers, right? Independent retailers that are asking for this, right? And so I think there's some, own, you know, some of that onus should and could be put on on the retail yeah. side of things to help unlock a lot of that, a lot, a lot of the need for that, right? Because because it it can and should become its own self-fulfilling prophecy, right? We've seen that. I, I've seen that time and time again in this industry, things that become their own self-fulfilling prophecy because it either starts on the investment side or it starts on the retailer side. Mm -hmm. um, and then it just it just bubbles out from there, right? Consumers see more of it and the consumers say, oh, this must be a thing, right? Well, I'm gonna tack onto this, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I feel strongly that like we need to make regen a thing, right? We need to make, we need, we need to create it. So a self-fulfilling prophecy with it. Um, and that only happens if like collectively, you know, from, from the ground up, especially on the retail side, we can all get together and, and, and prioritize it. So, yeah. Kyle, sure. I love that example for a variety of reasons. And, you know, in particular, like, like where does a movement begin? You know, is it, is it ever retailers first? Probably not. Is it brands first? Is it consumers driving the brands? Is it, is it mission driven brands who are pulling consumers, you know, into the movement? And there's, there's, I mean, I'm sure, you ask 10 different people, they might come up with 10 different answers. But I think what really, to me, what really comes down is that education piece, like you mentioned earlier, right? Like as a collective, that's really where we need to be focusing to ensure that consumers understand why this is important for them, why it's important for the planet, so on and so forth. And yeah. I'm curious from your perspective, as an existing brand who hasn't had that same regenerative attribute, how are you transitioning your marketing and your messaging mm -hmm. as a brand to your existing consumers to say, hey, like this is what we stand for now. This is why it's yeah. different. This is why it's important. And then part two, how are you casting yeah. a different net to try to bring more people into the wild way fold with that new regenerative attribute? Yeah. Um, yeah. Those are fantastic questions, right? Um, yeah. Because so much of our current consumer base has been dietary attribute focused, right? Um, with the grain free, the lower sugar, like all of these things. And so we've, we've, we've done consumer surveys in the past about, Hey, about sustainability, about some of these things and, 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 and how they rank and, and still dietary attributes still, of course, taste and price are always going to be number one. Right. I mean, I think this is, right. this is something that's been echoed on right. your, you guys' podcast like a million times. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, it's always going to be taste and price. So we can't ignore, we can't ignore that first of all. Right. Um, cause that's mm -hmm. where people are going to buy first. Um, and so, you know, for us, marketing kind of the region side of things, knowing that like tasting price is going to come first, we know that first of all, we have to create a product that's going to taste great, right? Um, that's going to, that's, that's going to have great flavor profiles. That's not going to be too um, crazy. I mean, that was, that was part of the decision to kind of go down the route of producing the oats, right? Because it's not a, it's not a weird product, right? It's ubiquitous, like they're oats, right? It's oatmeal. Right. Everybody knows how to eat it. Everybody, you know, and that's the impetus behind the flavor profiles that we chose. Right. Everybody's familiar with those flavor profiles. Right. We're not creating some like oob matcha, like weird stuff that people are like, oh, like, I don't know what that's going to taste like in an oatmeal. Right. I mean, you can't, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you have to, you, you know, you have to pick and choose your battles. Right. And so we said, let's choose something that's ubiquitous, something that people know how to eat, know how to use. Let's choose flavors that people are familiar with and let's get that piece. You know, let's not, so we don't have to educate people there. Right. Like, you know, that's already done for, mm -hmm. that's already been done for us over time. Right. And so now we can focus on some kind of the environmental attributes, you know, of the, of the package of the product um, and those types of things. And so I think that that's, that's becomes a big part of it, right? Not having, because, you know, consumers aren't going to intake all of that at once at the store, right? They're not going to want to have to intake, like, right. what do these flavors look like? How am I going to eat this? What kind of is this product? Oh, and it's environmentally friendly, right? They, you have to like take a lot of that, you know, brain width, you know, bandwidth away and just say, hey, this, this is what I want you to focus on, right? Like this is oatmeal. It's a flavor you should be familiar with, but it's better for the environment. It's better for the planet. Um, and let me to kind of give you some ways in, in, in which you can, um, in which I can market that to you. And so like for, for our oats, for example, one of the things, one of the phrases that we use is that they go beyond sustainable. Right. And, yeah. and I don't know how much you guys have like read, you know, that, that quote actually is inspired by an old Bob Rodale quote uh, when he was mm -hmm. interviewed years ago. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the interview asked him what was different about regenerative. And he said, well, regenerative goes beyond um, sustainable. Um, was kind of the word that he used. And I love that so much. And I was like, oh my gosh, I love that. Um, that's fantastic. I want to use that in some way. Um, and so, we, you know, 
that that was the inspiration for kind of using it in our packaging to saying, hey, this is a um, a product that's farmed in a way that kind of goes beyond and kind of takes the next step, right? Mm-hmm. Because we can't afford to simply just stay with the status quo, right? Sustainability to me is sustainability to me is just status quo, right? We can't afford just to kind of stay with the status quo and do things the way things have always been done that won't create change right and so if change is the goal we have to go beyond what we're currently doing so to me that's where the power of regenerative lies is that it's going beyond it's it's taking these extra steps to go beyond what we're currently doing to create better outcomes so yeah love that man and i you you read my mind because i pulled up a big picture of the of the oats and i wanted to talk about the packaging really as a case study for like what y'all think will resonate with consumers. And like Kyle just said, in a bright color at the very top of the bag, it says oats that go beyond sustainable in all caps in pretty large font. They're called literally planet friendly oats. There's a beautiful picture, like a background photo on the package of a field of oats. And then you have, you know, USDA organic non-GMO and ROC uh, and gluten-free, all the, the logos pretty prominently featured there on the front. Um, and I would love to kind of hear you, you talked about that romance copy on the top. Why print planet friendly oats? Why, what, why not planet positive oats or, you know, how, how did y'all envision that specifically? I mean, that's a big deal. Like how did y'all see that playing with consumers? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the impetus behind that was just to get somebody to go planet friendly. Like why? Or like, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, what you always want to do is, is have something that let, gets the consumer to take the next step, which is to grab the bag, pick it up, and like look and read on it, right? Because um, mm-hmm. most people they just walk up and down the shelves, right? Twenty seconds, grab what they want to grab and go, right? Yeah. And so we said, hey, we could just we could call these organic oats, right? We could call these just oats and just call out the region logo really big. But like, what is a way that we can really get a consumer to say, okay, like they're calling out the planet specifically, like why like i want to know why right why why are these planet friendly like how do these go beyond like give me some you know you know with, without trying you know at the, without the same time like i'm super cognizant of really trying not to be greenwashy right and so mm. you know that was a big discussion even with the planet friendly is like hey it's planet friendly is that are we starting to get greenwashy with like what we're doing like how do we how do we ensure that we're like getting people to understand that these are that these that this product like does better things for the environment without like right you know, taking that extra selling. step that like, that, that goes too far. Right. Right. So it's yeah, like, yes, right. I, I, they're not I, planet know, how do we it, right? They're planet friendly. Oats. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And that, you know, which is a good segue because like we had played with, that was the initial thing that we played with was like planet. Do we want to talk about saving the planet in some way or like how this saves the planet? And we said, well, we, that's starting to get like a little bit too kind of greenwashy because we're not actually saving the planet, even though like this is something that, that at scale, like really, really, I truly believe really can, you know, kind of reverse a lot of the negative impacts that our food system is having. But how do we, how do we get those environmental attributes across without being greenwashy while also making sure that we can like stoke some kind of curiosity in the customer, right? I mean, because I think that was a big impetus behind why the grain-free granola did so well too, because it's it's a clearly it's a clear oxymoron, right? Someone goes, well, grain-free grain, no, like grain is in the word granola, like grain-free, like what does that mean? <laughs> and so I think. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, I think that that caused a lot of people to say, you know, huh. And then, you know, when, and so when we were testing it at farmer's markets early on, we realized like people would always go grain fruit granola, like how does that work? But it caused them to stop, pick up the bag and like, look, and we said, okay, I think we have something here with a name because that's the goal, right? We want people to stop and not just get what they've always gotten off the shelf, but like say, Hey, what, what is that? And why is it what it is? And so I think that's the impetus behind the, the planet friendly right there and the beyond sustainables. What is the way that we can stoke some kind of curiosity in the customer to where they'll stop, pick it up, read more and say, Oh, these are regenerative organic. This is what it does. You know, here's how these are grown. This is why it's better. Cool. I like it. I'm going to buy it. Right. And so I think that that's, mm-hmm. that's part of the, not the game, but just part of like the, how can we stoke some cur- enough curiosity yeah. in the customer to, to want to learn more about what regenerative is. Right. Right. I think it's a really good point and it's a great example. You know, we talk about how regenerative awareness, a lot of people might hear the term, might not really understand the term, but most people maybe have not even heard the term before ever. So when you use the term like sustainable that everybody knows and has some association with it, you can say like, we're gonna tie beyond to sustainable. So you're mm-hmm. using a familiar trade attribute and yeah. saying we're, we're better than that. That to your point kind of stokes mm-hmm. like, oh, I care about sustainability. This is somehow better than sustainability. I wanna pick this up and learn more. Um, yeah. So I think that's really interesting, um, especially because like, I think all of these brands right now, to your point, are trying to figure out like, how do we package this in the right way that people are going to start to understand what this is so that we can communicate this relatively nuanced, complicated you know, value system 
to a consumer on a package within three seconds, right? Not easy to do. Um, I've got a question. You mentioned earlier before the environmental impacts of the packaging. Are there any specific packaging differences here that make this different than like some of the other packages within the granola aisle? Yeah. So when we initially launched the oats in a fully home compostable package, so it was a package wow. that was made from cassava, beetroot and eucalyptus fibers. And so um, it wasn't petroleum plastic at all. Um, it was, yeah. Um, so getting rid of a lot of that plastic is something that, you know, I think is incredibly important as well. I don't think that, you know, it doesn't make any sense to me to do all these great things on the supply side and then just pack it in like a virgin petroleum plastic package, right? Like that, that to me, that's completely, um, you know, uh, not the point, right? And so you know, there's a lot of challenges with the packaging as well, um, on the packaging side of things as well. Um, you know, but I felt strongly about wanting to launch these initially in a home compostable pouch to kind of signify, hey, here's what we're trying to do um, on the packaging side of things. Um, you know, so we launched those initially in that. The packaging that it's in right now after the launch is a packaging made from 50% recycled and reclaimed material so which is kind of the highest amount that we've seen lately is 50 percent and so i said okay if we can if we can at least reduce 50 percent of the virgin plastic like we're getting somewhere yeah. um because a big part of moving to fully home compostable pouches just like in moving ingredients for gin organic it's just a massive cost increase right i mean we're talking three to four times the cost of just wow. putting them in a conventional plastic pouch right Damn. and so you know yeah of course, you know, then you're talking about, okay, well, this is, this impacts cash flow. This is now impacting margin and all these other things. And so before I go out and like move all of my packaging to home compostable and like, you know, spend all the money and resources doing all this and, and, and take all the margin hits, like we need to know if the consumer cares enough about it to, to want to pay a premium for it. If it's something that they, that that's going to make, the, if it's going to be an extra to make them want to buy it, right? Hey, if, if I have to pay a dollar more that this is regenerative organic, am I going to pay $2 more if this is regenerative organic? And also I can put the pouch in my home, home compost in, in my backyard, right? Um, and so we're trialing that out now to get some of that data to see like how the consumer responds to that, how much they care, how much they really care about it, if they're going to put their money towards it. I think there's there's some interesting data out there. Um, so I was at NCN this past week and, and Nick McCoy um, of Whipshit shared some interesting data about um, the fact that consumers do care about sustainable packaging. The index is really high for consumers, um, you know, but they say that. Do they put their money towards that? Right. I, I was just is, about is to say, the, I, is going to be the kicker. I think that's bullshit. I, I mean, I think so much of that data <laughs> is preference and not purchase and purchase is what really matters. And that's that's why it's a challenge. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I'm all, we're also seeing a lot of purchase data to be bullish about, so I'm not trying to be a negative Nancy there, but I just I just don't put as much weight into that, into the preference piece. Like yeah. everyone while yeah. they're sitting at home yeah. watching Netflix is gonna say, Yeah, I'd love to spend a, a dollar more and then they're walking the aisle, they're you know, that that's not always the reality hundred hundred of times out of hundred. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I mean it, it you know, the packaging side, the same as ingredient side, right? There needs to be more collaboration on that right yeah. because if we can collaboratively all say like hey we all want to move to compostable materials right then we can mm -hmm. you know and we can start ordering material you know and we can kind of find a way to collaborate all that material into like one former mm -hmm. like one processor one like one one bag former right then mm -hmm. it can get to a price point where we can all swallow right um because right now it's it's at a price point that's incredibly tough to swallow right mm -hmm. um and so that's something that that we're, we're we're definitely need some more collaboration on, um, but it's a direction that we're we're incredibly cognizant of, like the, the impact that the plastic is having, and wanting to really truly get rid of that completely in the supply chain, right? And so yeah. the the home compostability is great, and we want to be able to do that at scale, um, but I think it's going to take time and scale to get there as well. Um, mm -hmm. But but to me to to me again, that's that's the gold standard, right? It's something that's truly cir circular right whether it's completely home compostable right because the industrial compostable stuff is great and that exists out there but if you have to take that bag and then mail it off to an industrial compostable facility that creates its own carbon footprint like how much better are we actually doing right like what's the true like right. you know life cycle or you know the the, the true carbon cycle of that of, of that whole yeah. process right and so it's either got to be truly home compostable um or um, or it's got to be truly recyclable, right? And so we're, we're trialing out three different materials right now. Two of them are fully home compostable. Um, we're trialing these out on our equipment because they operate very differently on our equipment as well. Um, and then trialing out some, a product that's 
fully recyclable in the paper recycle chain, which is a little different than the, than the stuff that exists now in the plastic recycle chain. So the stuff that exists now, right, is store drop-off, right? So same issues, right? You have to go take it to a store um, that has a store drop-off recyclable. Um, and then there's also a lot of municipalities and that just don't have the capacity to even recycle those things. So even a lot of the store yeah. drop-off stuff just ends up going to the landfill, right? And so the paper recycle chain is really interesting to me because it's one, it's it's more available to consumers. You can put it in your bin at home, right? You don't have to take it to a mm-hmm. store. Um, and it's a lot it's a lot more recycled at a lot more municip- municipalities. And so just really trying to look for ways to like, um, to create circularity in the supply chain. Supply chain. And, and so we're a part of uh, One Step Closer's packaging collaborative of what, as well. Yeah. So they're doing a nice. lot of great work on the packaging yeah. side, um, trying to help people move to those more sustainable materials. And so um, that's part of it, right? That's part of it. We can't, you know, again, we can't do these great things with the supply chain on the ingredient side and then, you know, pack it in a petroleum based, you know, mm-hmm. uh, bag. BPA lined. Way, right? yeah. 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 Just, just doesn't work. I've right? got to find a, we've got to oh. take steps to, to be better. Yeah. Super, super happy you brought up, brought up one step closer. They're amazing. Do amazing work. We'll drop a link uh, to their organization in the, the show notes. And I come back to what we talked about with Cody Hopkins in a recent interview, which is we need scale and efficiency, but we have to do it cooperatively or collaboratively. I mean, this, is, this shit is not rocket science. Like I've been fortunate to be part of a private equity acquisition and all they do is buy a lot of businesses, synergize the shit out of, shit out of them and make them more efficient. And we can do that without having to have a holding company or a private equity structure, but it's going to require a lot of work and investment in collaboration and creative corporate structures and, you know, things that can really move the needle there. And hopefully the the Regen Coalition is one piece of that puzzle that can become a big piece of that puzzle over time. Um, But speaking of private equity, uh, I know we want to chat about kind of how the business has been funded to date, some things that you're working on there right now, Kyle. Um, So maybe... Yeah. You mentioned this thing's been bootstrapped from day one. Take us through that a little bit, just the top line, some challenges there, how that's been a unique journey, and then bring us up to speed on uh, this redeemable equity piece that you're exploring right now for the business. Yeah. I'm going to layer one additional point in there. If you could do like a contrast between standard VC funding in the natural products industry and what you're looking to help build and support, um, I think that'd be really interesting for our, con- yeah. our, our listeners uh, to hear. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, like you mentioned, we've we've been bootstrapped um, from the beginning, right? So the only money that's ever flown into the business was the old friends, family, and fools um, amount, like really early on, right? <laughs> to, just, to just get it off the ground, right? Um, and they, they all they all probably still think they're fools at this point, um, you know. But it wasn't much, right? It was, it, you know. And so we, um, it's been a fun journey um, and a very difficult journey, growing a bootstrapped company, and just it's it's a it's a very different company um running a company that way right it's it's a lot more disciplined i think discipline is probably the biggest word that i would use to 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 describe it um a lot more disciplined growth um is is the big one right so we've grown fairly slowly um over the past decade right and i have no problem saying that like i'm super proud of like what we've built um, because we've done it sustainably, um, we've done it profitably, we've been profitable most of the years, um, you know, but there's also some, some caveats that come to that, right? Um, that, 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 you know, that come for that with that slow growth, right? And that's, you have a lot of copycats. It gives time for copycats to come in the space and kind of overtake what you're doing. Um, it gives, it gives copycats an opportunity to come to stores and say, oh, well, hey, this company, they're bootstrapped. They're not going to pay your slotting. Like I will like replace them with me. Right. And, and that happens yeah. and that has happened. Right. And so, you know, you have to deal, you're just going to, those are things you're going to have to deal with, right? You don't have, we don't have the deep pockets um, to give to retailers. And so if it's over the years, if it's been between us and another brand and we can say, well, you know, I, I, you know, like I can't pay your slotting. Sorry. Like I just can't do it. Like I can do a free fill, but I can't do slotting, you know, and we're up against another brand that's going to say, Hey, I'll free fill two cases and give 10 K per skew. Like we're going to lose that every day. Right. And, and I get it. Right. It's a business, right. Retailers are running a business just like we're running a business. Um, you know, and I don't blame them for that. Um, and so it, it makes growth a lot more difficult. Right. And, mm-hmm. and in that sense, um, and, uh, the bets you have to take are just smaller, right? We have to take a lot smaller bets. You know, I was just talking to somebody about this the other day and, and liking it to, to, you know, playing in a poker tournament, but like only being able to bet like 10 bucks, even when you have a really good hand, right. Instead of like yeah. 10,000 bucks when you have a good hand, right? Like, like you can have great hands all day, but if you can only bet 10 bucks, you know, each time, like you're either going to eat your way through or like at some point, like someone's going to go all in and, and put you out of business. Right. And so your bets have to be a lot smaller. Um, they have to be a lot more conservative. You have to be a lot more conservative with innovation um, and what you bring to the table. Um, knowing that like, if you make a really big bet and it's wrong, like, 
that could mean the business, right? Um, we don't have the deep pockets to like have a big bet go bad, um, right? And so um, that's a big part of it. Um, and then just kind of saying no, I think standing up for ourselves and saying no to a lot of the things that people have said are typical or that you have to do in this industry, I think is mm. is something that growing a bootstrap company you have to do. And so um, slotting is a good example. There. Like. Yeah, what are some top ones there? Slotting is a big example. We've always just said no, like I'm not doing slotting. It doesn't create a win-win, right? Like you get you get this money and I don't get any guarantee as far as like where am I at the shelf, how long I'm on the shelf. Um, that creates mm -hmm. a win for you and a lose for me, right? And and if yeah. it's not a win-win partnership, like and it's not something that we're going to, to take part in. So we've said no. I've said no to, gosh, I don't know how many retailers over the years because, because they just want too much. They, hey, slotting two cases. And I said, okay, well... Like, no, like I'm, it, it's just a no, right? It's a straight no. And I, that's where that, and that's, you know, um, you know, it's a thanks, it's a thanks, but no thanks. Right. And that's where the discipline comes in. Um, and then same on the distributor side, right? You know, a lot of people have had issues with, with these big national distributors, like with deductions and like not paying on time. Um, and so we've had no problem with the year saying, Hey, you know, unify, like you're late to payment. Like we're not going to ship you anything until we get paid. I'm like, sorry, like cancel, mm -hmm. cancel your trucks this week, cancel them next week. Um, mm -hmm. and guess what? We magically get paid. Um, you know, and so there's a lot of people that don't think that you can do those things or have the power to do those things as a small company. Yeah. But, you know, I've always been a big proponent of just standing up for what we think is right and what we think is the yeah. right way to do business. Right. And so, you know, the slot, the slotting, all the free fills, all of this like erroneous deductions and things like those don't really, those don't build an equitable business in my opinion. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if, we're in business to, to, to be in the business of doing good and to build an equitable business. And so if, and we want our partners to have those same, you know, those same values as us. And so if you're not going to be a retail partner or distributor partner, that's going to have those same values, then, Hey, thanks. Thanks, but no thanks. And so it's, it's, mm -hmm. it creates a lot of discipline to do that. Right. Um, yeah. and, and it's really hard yeah, to I do that. Wanna, it's I really pause hard. I comment on that really quick. Sorry to interrupt, but it, I think what you're doing is so needed in the industry. I think what has happened with the VC boom over the last 10 years is that retailers have these and distributors have these unrealistic expectations that every brand, especially startups have these deep VC pockets mm -hmm. and they can mm -hmm. afford all these fees. And it's, it's put, the asks even higher, you know, like slotting at air water, mothers or some of these like smaller regional chains is just becoming insane amount of requests, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, and I think the more brands who can, to your point, collaborate, work together to push back and say, look, like this isn't a win-win partnership. This is why we're not going to do this. We'd love to be on your shelves. We'd love to create win-win partnerships because it's not about being stingy yeah. to your point. Like it's got to be good business. So I want yeah. to commend you for that and, and kind of just advocate that like more brands should be doing this stuff. And it's something that we, we try really hard to do at Kettle and Fire as well. And it is amazing how much leverage you can have if you're willing to draw a line in the sand and say, look, this is what's right for our business. This is what isn't right for our business. And like have those candid conversations. And sometimes you have to say no. Um, yeah. So again, just, yeah. just kudos to, to doing that. I interrupted. Let's get back on track with uh, yeah. the VC <laughs> standard versus like the, the new fundraising style you're going for. Yeah, I mean, so the VC standard, right, is it's it's brought it's essentially brought tech funding to food, right? Um, it's brought this funding model in which, in order for the VC to make the returns that they're promising their LPs and their funds, you know, you as a brand have to exit for an incredibly large multiple, right? Um, or have to at least have the potential to exit for an incredibly large mm -hmm. multiple, right? That's that's the goal, right? And so as 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 a VC. I want to invest in 20, you know, 20, 30 brands, right? That all have the potential to exit big, knowing that one of them is probably going to exit big, right? Two of them might kind of net net or exit a little smaller and the rest are all going to fail, right? Go to zero, hundred percent, right? But that one giant exit is going to make my return on all the other like 18 out of the 20 companies that all went out of business trying to do the same thing, um, but weren't successful at it, right? And so... The problem that we have is that 99% of 99.99% probably of CPG companies today aren't going to have that massive exit, right? They're not built for that massive exit. Um, it's, it's not gonna. It's like it's it's the equivalent of winning the lottery, right? Um, it's not gonna happen for 99.99% of brands. Yet we fund 99.99% of brands all the same way, all as if they all have the potential to do that, right? And that's an incredibly broken system, right? We have to have a different funding model to which an investor can still get 
a good return, right? I'm not against capitalism, right? I'm not against like making money, right? That's, you know, that's, that's created leaps and bounds, all kinds of wonderful change in our industry, right? Um, VCs and capitalism has, so I'm not against that, right? Those models are great for the few companies that, that, that want to, to do that and want to have that massive exit return. But again, for the 99.99% of companies, either they're not going to have that rocket ship style growth and be acquired, right? Or, or they, or they just don't want to, right? They want to build a business that's mission driven and purpose aligned for the long term, right? And so it, it boggles my mind that again, I'll go back to the fact that we're all we all have this goal of creating change in the food industry, right? And if we're truly, if we truly do want to create that change, like that can't happen with a five to seven year timeline, right? Which is what most a lot of these funds timelines have before they need to show you know a return, right? And so it's like, yeah, you have five, you know, five, maybe call it five to ten years. You know, before you either got to exit, and get a before before some sort of liquidation event needs to happen, um, so my LPs get their return, right? Well, you know, again, like, you know, we can talk about this in terms of regenerative space. Like those changes, the changes that we all want to see with regenerative, they're not going to happen in a decade. They're not going to happen in five years. They're not going to happen in a decade. Like these are incredibly long-term outcomes that we're all shooting for, and so yeah. we need to be able to have models that fund companies for the long term, right? So that they can be around for the long term to mm -hmm. make this happen. And so that's the impetus behind the, the funding model that we're doing. So we're, we're trying to raise with the funding model called redeemable equity, right? And so what that is, 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 is an investor will buy shares of our company and we will redeem them, redeem all, redeem those shares over time. Right. And so, and, and those, and so we'll, we'll redeem 75% of the shares that they buy over time. So what that means is, is, is every quarter, um, we will redeem shares as a certain percentage of our revenue. So call it one, two percent of revenue, right? So say we have, you know, five hundred thousand um, dollars, and a company has five hundred thousand dollars in revenue for the first quarter, right? So we will, re if we're if we're redeeming those shares at two percent, right? We'll redeem a hundred thousand dollars worth of those shares the first quarter, right? And we'll do it again the second quarter, third quarter, vice versa, until seventy-five percent of the shares of that investor are fully redeemed, right? And so. Um, and then we put a multiple on it, right? So we'll say, hey, we'll redeem 2x. We'll redeem your shares at a 2x valuation from what you purchased them from for us. And so what that does for the investor is they get their return in their same timeline, this five to seven year timeline. They get their 2x return on 75% of the shares, yet they still get to keep 25% of the shares if there were some sort of liquidation event or acquisition or something down the line mm. for us. They still get to participate in that, right? So they still have that upside to participate in that massive exit should there wish to be one. But their return and what they're promising their fund um, is not predicated on us exiting, right? If it happens later on, they get to participate in that upside, that's great. But regardless of if that happens or not, like they're getting a 2x return on 75% of the shares that they purchased from us, right? So they're getting that return, they're getting it risk reduced over time, right? And so from that first quarterly redemption on, like their risk as an investor continues to get reduced as we continue to stay in business. And so, you know, I, you know, I feel like it's it's a true win-win for both founder and funder, right? So we get to stay mission aligned and purpose driven. We don't have to to be susceptible to this growth at all costs business model. We don't have to to run our business in a way that's going to generate a massive exit if we don't want to, right? We can run it in a way that's more aligned with 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 our mission and our values, right? And on the investor side, you know, they get their risk reduced, right? They still get a decent return. Right? And they still get to participate in upside if there were some um, upside or if there were some like potential exit um, at the end of the day as well. So it's it's to me it solves a lot of the problems that 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 exist with the traditional funding model, right? Because as an entrepreneur, I get that equity back, right? I get that equity back and I can do what I want with that equity, right? I can create a steward owned business and give that equity to my employees. And so our employees and stakeholders then become owners in my own business, right? Um, with the traditional funding model, like I don't get the opportunity to do that, right? Um, and so many entrepreneurs I've seen over the years get sucked into these models early on and then their vision for what they want for the business changes later, but guess what? Like they can't, they can't do anything about it. Right. right. Because they're stuck in, they're, they're stuck into, they're stuck on this train of like, well, I got to grow and like exit and, and I have to generate a certain return. The minute you put a financial return onto something, right. That becomes, that comes first, right. That, that comes first before purpose, before mission, before anything else. At the end of the day, if you have to generate a return, um, for your VC and for them, for their LPs, like that's going to come first. Right. And so I've seen so many entrepreneurs get stuck in this, on this kind of Ferris wheel or on this roller coaster early on. 
Um, and then later on, they're like, oh, well, you know, I don't know if I want to exit or man, I, re I really would love to like for my employees to own my business and create something for the long term, but they don't have that optionality anymore because they gave that away yeah. early on, right? Whereas this model yeah. um, gives them that optionality, lets them get that equity back um, so they can do what they want with it, um, still gives the investor a return and still, give the, still gives the investor a potential to participate should there be some like big exit down the road. Um, but again, it gives the entrepreneur optionality, right? It gives them optionality, lets them grow their business in a more sustainable way, um, lets, them grow, lets them grow their business in a mission-focused, purpose-aligned way, um, again, while, while also like giving an investor a good return. Again, I'm not against capitalism. This isn't like true impact investing or this isn't like, nonprofit investing. This is like we still want to be able to generate a good return for the investor, right? That's a big part of it, right? If we can't generate a great return, then like this model doesn't work, right? right? I can't go out and say, hey, I want to do this redeemable equity model and you're going to get 8%. In five years, like, 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 there's too much risk, right? Like, no investor is going to go for that. They're going to go, okay, well, I'll just put my money in stocks and bonds, and like, I'll get eight percent, right? Um, but if you can say, hey, like, you know, like, you'll get twenty percent, you'll get a twenty, twenty-two percent return, you know, in five years on this, and you'll be able to participate in upside on top of that if you'd like, um, and it's risk reduced, right? Then we can kind of start to have more of a conversation, right? Because I'd, I'd love to put my personal money in that kind of like, that'd be great. I'd love that kind of return over five to seven years, right? Um, especially for a business that's especially doing- Especially if you're that. supporting a mission-driven brand, you know, like right. it fills that ethos bucket as well. Right, right. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. There, there is so much to unpack here. I have many thoughts. Uh, I'm sure that's shocking <laughs> to everyone. Um, you, you explained that really, really well, bro. It was, it was really well done. Um, the, the few things I would add are, you know, typical venture, the flaws really are one, it's designed for the 1%. So it's designed for a very small number of brands. As you said, it's binary. Yep. It's either a massive success or a massive failure. There's no middle ground and we need to build a solution for that middle ground. It's a limited set of tools. So it's save some convertible notes up front and then priced equity until an exit. And you just can't do the work we need to do with only those tools. And then Yep. Lastly, what you alluded to is the limited timeline. So not a lot of these businesses, especially if they have a regenerative supply chain and we're trying to maintain the integrity of that, are going to scale in a five, seven, 10 year timeline because that's the return timeline that you owe the LP. So you hit on all those. I just wanted to recap yeah. those. The, the things I would add yeah. on to that is I want to be careful to not throw the baby out with the bathwater. And this is very biased because I am trying to build a venture strategy for regen brands. So like, yeah. look, I'm throwing my bias out there up front, but I do think it is still an amazing tool for those 1%. And absolutely, I, you know, myself as the person trying to build, a, trying to bring a piece of significant capital to this space for the first time, the market dynamics dictate that you have to start there. And here's why, because yep. it's really hard to raise a meaningful amount of money on unproven tools and everything outside of that, even though the batting average is still low, is an unproven tool. So we, it's, it's really hard to raise $10 million, let alone 25, 30, 50, which is what we need to make a meaningful dent in this thing. Second, secondly, we do have a, a slate of brands that I would call in the 1% that need funding, we could fund and, and could scale yep. and exit at a venture timeline and, and return. Um, and then the third thing, which is really the biggest flaw, which ties back into the first thing is, Unfortunately, as a professional fund manager, manager, you have to earn the right to be innovative. And so what I mean by that is I can't take some super new strategy to potential LPs and raise that significant amount of money until I've proven myself over typically three funds, which sucks, but that's the world we live in. And so it's almost the unfortunate order of operations of I got to go do one, two, three, four pretty vanilla funds, have success, and then I can come back to that same group of people in the market generally and say, hey, y'all, we're going to raise $50 million now for this other strategy that we think is, we're still very bullish on, but it's more of an R&D trial because there's not this super big sample size to say this is for sure going to work or for sure has this, this type of an outcome. So that was a lot, but I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I echo all those things like 100%, right? I mean, and that's, you have to have that success to justify it, right? Um, you know, and, and it's, it's the same feedback we've gotten our, so far already going out with this model, right? If people are like, hey, it's, you know, like, 
like thanks but this hasn't been successful for so it's really hard for me to like justify even to my mm -hmm. lps investing in something with this model when it's not been proven out right and the same with same with region right and again we can go back to talking about the self-fulfilling prophecy right like you guys have been around long enough to know like hey when crave sold years ago right the jerky market just blew up right you know because there was all that money that got generated by that sale and so everybody wanted a piece of the next one right and so all of a sudden like all this money went into better for you jerky and you saw you know two dozen like better for you jerky brands just explode over like the next two years after that, after that, um, after that sale. And so like, yeah, I, I can totally understand the market dynamic that like there needs to be some, some relatively, you know, significant success, um, capitalistically wise in the regenerative space for someone to say, Oh, Hey, like somebody made a, a shit ton of money with regenerative, like, okay, cool. Like I'll put some money, you know, see so something that we can point to to say, Hey, this was a massive success. Right. And there's a lot of people that made a lot of money doing it and doing it this way um, to be able to, to, to bring more money to the table there. So I, I totally understand those market dynamics and, and, and it's, that's the system, right? Um, but it's also a system that we're, 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 we're trying to change and we're fighting to change and trying to do something better. And it's, it's certainly an uphill battle. Um, a, a big uphill battle, right? A mountainous battle, I'd say, more than a hill. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 we're gonna fight it, right? So, yeah, yeah. I think I just want to call out, like you earlier in the podcast, Kyle, you did a fantastic job. Sorry, wow, Kyle, you did a fantastic job of outlining all the different <laughs> challenges that you as a regenerative brand are facing, from logistics to supply chain to mm -hmm. packaging to like all those different things. And it's so hard to try to like follow that venture model of growth because there's so many like uphill battles that we talked about. So it's so, and I'm just glad we're having this really candid conversation. It's like, it's nearly impossible to hold a truly regenerative mission driven brand to the same standard as these historical exits for, you know, Crave or RX or, you know, yeah. Yeah. whoever else. It, it, it's just the model doesn't work for that type of a system that's trying to do good. So I just want to call that out at a super high level. Um, but I also want to kind of pivot towards the future. You know, if you were to receive these funds, like what is it that Wildway is trying to accomplish in the next year, in the next three years, five years? Is that more SKUs? Is that getting more existing SKUs rock? Is that generating maybe some new products that, you know, help to build out different rock supply chains? Walk us through the future for Wildway. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I think we're at kind of a, a crossroads and a real pivot point now in the brand in, in that, you know, we've committed to going full ROC, right? And that's what we've committed to kind of doing in the direction that we've committed to going. And so right now we really play in two dis very distinct ROC supply chains, right? One with kind of nuts and dried fruit. That's a little, that's a little, it's quite a bit, that's global, right? Our supply chain is very much globally based. Um, and then we kind of play in this oat space and they're looking at different, you know, grains and 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 some things that are that's got a more a lot more of a domestic supply chain right on the rc front and so for us mm -hmm. you know it's hard enough doing all, all of what we're doing on roc to begin with right so yeah. kind of the big kind of decision now is like where do we go with the product portfolio and supply chain right do we double down mm -hmm. what's happening globally and go more on kind of nuts mm -hmm. and dried fruit and seeds and some of these things yeah. that that are grown all over the place or we double down on um, having an impact more domestically, you know, with oats and grains and a lot of in these rotational crops. And so two very different supply chains, right? And two very different paths. And so, yeah. you know, a big part of like what we're, what we're raising for, what we're trying to do now, a lot of the work that we're doing now is taking a look at, okay, one, where can we have the most impact, right? Where is the most impactful space to play? Um, where can we have the most impact on climate, on the regenerative space? Um, two, what is something that, what, what, what is, what is the supply chain that we can get into that where the impact can scale, right? And so it's got to be a vi it's got to be viable, right? It's got to be viable. It's got to be impactful. It's got to be something that that can a movement that we can truly like grow under and get roots under. Um, and yeah. three, where can we create a white space in the market to make this work on the retail side as a CBG brand, right? And so those are kind of the three big burning questions that we're asking ourselves now um, that will really kind of shape where we want to go the future of the brand right are is it are we going to want to go more nuts seeds dried fruit um, build out more of that supply chain work more there or are we do we want to double down in like more traditional breakfast right and cereals and grains and and really dig into the, the to the domestic supply chain um, and really work more with rotational crops and what these farmers are doing and solve some of the issues um, that some of these smaller farmers are having with rotational crops and finding a market for those and a market for some of those grains so I think there's there's a lot of value right to both, um, and so I think it's it's you know again, but it's it's putting together impact, you know, can the impact scale? 
Um, is, it, is it something viable that we can take to retail? And then is can we create a white space in the market for us and our brand to make sure that we can continue to grow the brand to continue to have that impact, right? Because it's not going to do us any good if we if we double down at the supply chain and go out of business in five years because we can't create white space and there's no you know market need on the retail side, right? And so those are all conversations that we're having now and, and I'm meeting with a lot of people over the next like few weeks to kind of determine where we want to take the brand, uh, where we want to go, how do we want to play this out, where can we have the most impact. Um, I've had a lot of great conversations, a lot of great conversations with advisors, investors, uh, people within the supply chain um, to help to help us understand like where what is the next evolution of Wildway, right? What is kind of I call I've I've called it kind of Wildway 2.0, right? What is what where do we want to take the brand from here, um, and and how do we want to have the greatest impact? And I think that the most important, like like one of the greatest things for us in, in having those conversations is the fact that we haven't taken venture capital yet, and so we have that optionality to kind of go out and determine what we do, right? I don't have someone saying, well, I got to generate a return. So this is what you're going to do with your supply chain, your products. Here's the products you're going to produce because the velocities are great and the margins are great. And this is, you know, this is, you know, and so we have the optionality um, and we're profitable, right? So we have the optionality and the time to kind of sit back and go, what makes the most sense for us? Um, and what makes the most sense for the market, what makes the most sense for this movement, um, and where can we combine those things to create a truly impactful mission-driven company um, for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, right? Not for the next five. So. Yeah, I super appreciate that answer, primarily because of the order in which you answered. And this has been a recurring theme with a lot of the regenerative brands we've had on here in the best way possible, yeah. is that impact is driving innovation and future decision-making. And it's really about how you're utilizing your brand to make the biggest positive impact for people and planet. And I super appreciate that. I'm also going to throw my own biased opinion in here that I'm so bullish on regenerative domestic grains and the impact they can have in the United mm -hmm. States. And I think another one of the key components of selling regenerative to consumers in the United States is that it's going to have a positive impact in the United yeah. States. And that's not mm -hmm. necessarily to say that any of the um, international or a broad regenerative efforts. I don't mean to diminish those efforts in any capacity, yeah. but to make people care, it, I think yeah. it's easier to do that when it impacts their daily life, right? Yeah. And yeah. regenerative grains can increase the water holding capacity. They can reduce carbon runoff into the oceans, reducing carbon dead zones on our coastlines, um, yeah. reducing planet temperature. Like there's just so much positive that can happen from all of that arable land. So yeah. my well, vote. I mean is domestic grains, but obviously, yeah. you know, I'm <laughs> well, and, and the, you know, and the, but the, and the stats are wild, right? And so 60% of the food that's grown in the United States comes from industrialized monoculture farms and GMO crops, mm -hmm. and it's used for animal feed and ethanol production, 60%, mm -hmm. right? Over half that's of insane. the food that's produced in this country comes from industrialized systems that goes for animal feed and ethanol. Like we don't, you know, like, like not only is it like tearing up the land, but like, we don't even need it. It's tearing up the things that we eat that then tear us up. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, it's it's wild how you know when I when I realized that I was like wow we the problem is massive right um, it, it's yeah. it's yeah. And we, the but, opportunity but, is massive but the opportunity is massive as well right there's an incredible opportunity to kind of change that and shift that and fix that so yeah yeah well it's the perfect segue I feel like I'm saying this on almost every episode now it's almost like we send the questions in advance or something um, <laughs> but. <laughs> Kyle, to wrap us up with the question we ask everybody, how do we get regen brands that 50% market share by 2050? Yeah. Um, again, man, I'm going to go back to the shirt, man. That's why I wore it on. That's why I wore it for this podcast, right? I think we, for, we, from, from a brand standpoint, from an investor standpoint, from a retailer standpoint, from a collective standpoint in this industry, we have to create businesses that value purpose over profit. We have to create businesses that value significance over scale. And we have to create businesses that value collaboration over competition, right? Across the board. Um, we have to do that, right? And if we can prioritize those things, I think we have a really good shot of, of, of growing um, the region movement and creating real change in our food industry. Mm -hmm. I really do believe that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Dude, well super said, appreciate man. everything you're doing. Um, it really sounds like an uphill battle, and I commend you and applaud your efforts. Um, stoked to try the Planet Friendly Oats. For those who are not, like, or those who want to follow up and learn more, it is wildwayoflife.com. Um, so go there, check it out, find some Planet Friendly Oats. Um, and yeah, man, super appreciate the time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank y'all so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, brother. For show notes, episode transcripts, and more information on our guests and what we discuss on the show, check out our website, regen-brands.com.
That is regen-brands.com. You can also find our Regen Recaps on the website. Regen Recaps take less than five minutes to read and cover all the key points of the full hour long conversations. You can check out our YouTube channel, Regen Brands Podcast, for all of our episodes with both video and audio. The best way to support our work is to give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform, subscribe to future episodes, and share the show with your friends. Thanks for tuning in to the Regen Brands Podcast, brought to you by the Regen Coalition and Outlaw Ventures. We hope you learned something new in this episode, and it empowers you to use your voice, your time, and your dollars to help us build a better and more regenerative food system. Love you guys.